What's up guys? Welcome to the Ozone and welcome to uh, another audiobook. Today we are reading the third and final story in the Puppet Carver. We are, we're reading Pizza Kit. Uh, I'm really excited for this one. Uh, I've heard good news about it just like I heard good news for Jump for Tickets and I wasn't disappointed by that story. Um, go and watch that if you haven't uh, or read it or whatever. Um, but yeah, we're going to read Pizza Kit today. Um, yeah, very, very, very excited for this one. Just to remind you, this is a reaction uh, and more of a read-through than a, like a full audiobook. Um, so yeah, we're going to get my reaction to this. Um, yeah, we should just get straight into it, I think. Okay. I can't believe you talked me into taking home Ek. Ek? <laughs> uh, who is Ek? Okay. Uh, Peyton said as she sat down with her best friend Marley at a long table in the classroom. Who takes home Ek these days? Come on, it's an easy A. Oh, like home economics. Okay, sorry. I was very confused. Like, who is Ek? <laughs> Marley said, taking a notebook out of her backpack. I mean, look around. How hard could it be? Surveying the classroom, Peyton had to admit that Marley might have a point. The room was lined with kitchen counters, sinks and stoves. There were sewing machines and a headless, armless mannequin for making patterns and adjusting hems. Tucked in one of corner of the room were a dryer and a washer, or a washer and a dryer. They were going to be graded on laundry. Peyton laughed. Well, it's not exactly the chemistry lab, is it? Nope, Marley said with a grin. And Mrs. Crutchfield is, like, a hundred years old, so she doesn't even know what's going on most of the time. She was my mom's home economics teacher, and mom said she wasn't young back then. She was my mom's home economic teacher too, Peyton said. Mom said that when she was a freshman. Girls were required to take home economics. Wow, that's super sexist, Marley said. What did the boys do while the girls were taking home economics? They took geography. Mom said it was like the school trying... Uh, Mom said it was like the school was saying that boys needed to know their way around the world and girls needed to know their way around the kitchen. <laughs> Too right? Not joking. <laughs> Peyton's mum did know her way around the kitchen, but she also knew her way around the bank where she was a branch manager. Like her mum, Peyton wanted a future where she could balance a career and a family. Good afternoon, young ladies. Peyton and Marley's conversation was interrupted by the quivery voice of Mrs. Crutchfield, who had just tottered into the room. She was a tiny, bird-like woman, wearing a navy blue dotted dress that she could very well have worn back when she was Peyton's mum's teacher, or somebody's grandmother's teacher. And welcome to Home Economics, where you'll be learning the, heart, the art of keeping a gracious home. Peyton rolled her eyes and gave Marley a look, which caused her to have a suppress, to suppress a giggle. Wait, Peyton thought. Wait, they, why, why is the spelling wrong here? Peyton and Peyton. That's, that's really weird. That's really weird. That's happened a few times in this book, actually. It's weird. Wait, Peyton thought. Mrs. Crutchfield had said young ladies. Did that mean there were no boys in the class? She looked around the room. Only girls. So maybe she hadn't changed that much since her mum was in school. Boys were allowed to take home economics now, but apparently they didn't choose to do so. You're going to learn skills such as cooking and cleaning and sewing, Mrs. Crutchfield said, gesturing toward the kitchen equipment and sewing machines in the room. But you're also going to learn the almost lost art of etiquette. Might any of you young ladies be able to use the word etiquette in a sentence? I ate a kit. A uh, Freddy Fazbear's pizza kit. <laughs> Peyton whispered to Marley who laughed. Freddy Fazbear's pizza kits were all the rage, even among high school kids. It was a nostalgia thing, Peyton supposed. Whether it was for a birthday or for no particular reason, visiting the Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit factory to build your own pizza was comforting and delicious. Mrs. Crutchfield turned her head toward Peyton. Could you repeat that so the whole class can hear it, please? Peyton felt her, he her face heating up. It was, it was just a stupid joke I whispered to Marley. Yes, Mrs. Crutchfield said. 
and now I'm asking you to share it with the whole class. Peyton knew her face was as red as a tomato. I said, I ate a kit, a Peer Freddy Fazbear's Peter kit. A few kids tittered, but the pun didn't seem nearly as funny when she had to say it out loud for everyone to hear. Very amusing, Mrs Crutchfield said. And it's interesting that you mentioned Freddy Fazbear's Pizza Kit because next week we will be joining the culinary acts, so acts, sorry, culinary arts class for a visit to the factory where they are made. The class erupted in cheers and cries of awesome and yes. Mrs Crutchfield displayed a very slight smile. Permission slips will go out on Wednesday. She looked at Peyton with a stern expression. But now, in all seriousness, can you give the class a definition of the word etiquette? Peyton was more than ready for Mrs Crutchfield's attention to shift elsewhere. Doesn't it mean, like, good manners? Yes, Mrs Crutchfield said. And from now on, I ask you to demonstrate good manners by raising your hand before you speak in my class. Yes, ma'am, Peyton said, barely above a whisper. She wondered if this class was going to be the walk in the park that Marley said it was. Mrs Crutchfield might be old, but it didn't seem like she missed much. Hey, could you set the table while I get the spaghetti cooking? Peyton's mum said. She was still wearing her nice blue blouse and grey dress slacks from work, but she had taken off her pumps and replaced them with, fizz uh, with fuzzy pink house slippers. Sure, Peyton said, getting up from the couch where she had been aimlessly channel surfing. And thanks to Mrs Crutchfield, I'll set the table 100% correctly so everybody will know we're living in a... She made quotation marks with the index and middle fingers of both hands. Gracious home. Peyton's mum laughed. Yeah, a gracious home where spaghetti with jarred sauce and a bag of pre-made salad are on the dinner menu. Mrs Crutchfield would probably call child protective services if she knew what I'm feeding you. She dropped the contents of a box of spaghetti into a steaming pot of water. How is Mrs Crutchfield doing anyway? The woman has got to be older than dirt. Peyton opened the silverware drawer and retrieved three forks. She still seems pretty sharp. She was sharp enough to call me out when I made some snarky comment to Marley. Yeah, you need to watch those, Mum said, stirring the noodles. I made snarky comments when I was in her class too, so she probably thinks you come by it honestly. Because I do, Peyton said, smiling. She set the forks to the left of the plates. Mrs Crutchfield said there should be separate forks for the salad and the entree. But Peyton put down one fork, her plate, put, put down one fork, her plate only. Oh, oh my gosh, I can't read. I, I read that as her, but it says per. <laughs> Peyton put down one fork per plate only. Why wash more silverware? I still don't know why you let Marley talk to you, uh, talk you into taking that class, Mum said, stirring the sauce with a wooden spoon. You could have taken art instead. You like art and you're good at it. Are you implying that I'm not good at gracious homemaking? Peyton said, batting her eyelashes theatrically and doing a curtsy. Mum, Mum smiled and shook her head. I'm implying that from the look of your room, you don't care a fig about gracious homemaking. I'm also implying that sometimes you let Marley talk you into things that you wouldn't do otherwise. Peyton sighed. It was an old argument. You don't like Marley. I like Marley fine, Mum said, ripping open the bag of salad and dumping its contents into a bowl. But she has some really strong personality and strong opinions, and I think that sometimes she steamrolls over other people and their wishes and opinions. She doesn't steamroll over me, Peyton said, opening the fridge door to find the parmesan cheese. People did say that Marley is bossy. But that's just because she's a natural leader, Peyton thought. Really? Mum raised an eyebrow. So you're telling me you would have taken home economics even if Marley hadn't suggested it? Peyton hated it when her mum backed her into a corner. Even when you were right, there was no winning an argument with her. Now who's the steamroller? All mums are like that. Uh, I'll be honest, all mums are like that. <laughs> No, I wouldn't have thought to take it, but the way she told me about it, it sounded fun and kind of funny. Well, I hope you find it funny when Mrs Crutchfield grades you on boiling an egg and gives you a C-. I'm speaking from experience here. The woman has impossible standards. Peyton sat on her bed, propped up on pillows, 
doing a boring social studies assignment on her laptop. On her walls, posters of the boys from her favourite K-pop group smiled down at her like they were inviting her to abandon her drudgery and go dancing with them instead. Oh god, K-pop is now canon. <laughs> An instant message from Marley popped up on her screen. What are you doing? Peyton welcomed the distraction. Homework? You? Nothing. Bored. You want to go over to the tasty cone? Doing homework, remember? So finish it or ditch it. Who cares? I'll meet you on the corner of Brook and Branch in half an hour. Peyton hesitated before responding. If she were to meet Marley in half an hour, that would mean she'd just have 20 minutes to finish her homework, which wasn't a realistic amount of time for the assignment she had. But a chocolate vanilla swone cone, swell cone, sorry, would taste really good and it was always fun to see who was hanging out at the tasty cone. Molly knew everybody and made easy conversation with them, unlike Peyton, who tended to be on the shy side. But she felt less shy when she was with Marley. Okay, she finally typed, see you in 30. Peyton raced through the rest of her homework assignment, doing what she knew was a slash, was a slap, ja, eh, slap dash job. <laughs> When she came downstairs, her mum and dad were on the couch watching one of those crime shows they found endlessly entertaining, even though every episode seemed identical to Peyton. Hey, Peyton said, already halfway to the front door. I'm going to walk with Marley to the tasty cone. Did you finish your homework? Mum asked. Yes, Peyton said. She didn't do it well, but she finished it. Do you need some money? Her dad asked. Got some, thanks. As Peyton shut the door behind her, she heard her mum call, be home by dark. Molly was standing on the corner of Brook and Branch, as promised. I had to get out of the house, Molly said. Mum and Dad have company. These friends they went to college with. And they're so boring. Every story starts with, do you remember that time? And ends with something totally unmemorable. Peyton laughed. Hey, at least they're trying to have fun. Trying but failing, Molly said. It's pathetic. Do you think you, do you, think you get to be a certain age and then just automatically get boring? I hope not, Peyton said. It was upsetting to think about. One birthday too many, and then you were an adult and incapable of having fun. It was all the more reason to have as much fun as possible now. They walked towards the tasty cone. A boy rode by on a bike and almost wrecked because he was looking at Marley. It was impossible not to be aware of Marley's beauty. She had golden blonde hair and big blue eyes that somehow unfairly managed to have long, dark lashes. Her body was slim but curvy enough to be feminine. Boys stripped over their feet or over their words when confronted with her. Girls were either too jealous or too insecure to be Marley's friend. But not Peyton. Peyton had no illusions about her own looks. So far, her short, skinny body was so free of curves, she looked like she'd been drawn using a ruler. Her hair and eyes were a dull brown and she had freckles that she hated. But when she hung out with Marley, it she felt like a little of she she felt like a little of Marley's glitter might rub off on her. She was like a plain little sparrow who was best friends with a flamingo. I feel that. Outside the tasty cone they sat at the pack at uh, the picnic table. Peyton with a chocolate vanilla swirl cone and Marley with a huge banana split. Another thing Peyton had noticed was that Marley could eat whatever she wanted and never seemed to gain an ounce. Don't look at the table behind us, Marley whispered, spooning up ice cream with banana and chocolate sauce. Naturally, Peyton looked. It was a table full of boys who were in their history class, drinking milkshakes and trading insults and laughing the way boys did. I told you not to look, Marley hissed at her. If you tell someone not to look at something, they're automatically going to look, Peyton said. It's like in elementary school when somebody tells you not to do something, then you do it anyway and say it's opposite day. Marley smiled. It was a dazzling smile, even though there was a hot fudge sauce on her upper lip. Sean Adamson is sitting at that table, she whispered. Emma Franklin said that Sean likes me. Peyton rolled her eyes. Marley, it's not like that's newsworthy or anything. All the guys like you... That's not true, Marley blushed, spooning up one more ice cream. <laughs> one more ice cream. Spooning up more ice cream. Well, okay, most guys like me, but most guys are gross. Sean's not gross. He's on the principal's list for good grades, and he's on the basketball team. He's so well-rounded. Plus, he smells good. 
Well, not stinking is important. Peyton said it to be funny, but it was true. A lot of ninth grade boys were not yet on speaking terms with deodorant, a fact that made the school always smell like a giant armpit. <laughs> Why don't you go talk to him? I can't just go talk to him. Marley looked at Peyton like she just said the most ridiculous thing on earth. Okay. Often Peyton felt like there was some kind of script for male-female behaviour that Marley had received but that she had missed out on. Peyton tended to be straightforward with people but apparently straightforwardness with the opposite sex violated some elaborate set of rules that no one had ever bothered explaining to her. Well I can't just go talk to him alone, Marley said. Maybe as we're leaving, we'll walk by his table. If he looks at me, I'll say hi to him. But it has to look casual. Like I just happened to see him as we were leaving. Not like I was going past his table to say hi to him on purpose. Okay, Peyton said again. While hanging out with Marley, there was always so much drama. Peyton sometimes felt like she was a minor character in a play Marley was starring in. Peyton didn't feel like she knew all the lines for this play or even like she quite understood the plot, but it was still entertaining and she was happy that a star like Marley had agreed to let Peyton share the stage with her. Okay, ready? Marley asked as soon as Peyton popped the last, pipe, the last bite of cone into her mouth. Sure, Peyton said, still chewing. They got up from the table and threw away their trash. They walked past the table where the boys were sitting. Peyton watched Marley work. Marley paused by the table just long enough to catch Sean's eye. Oh, hi Sean, she said as if she was surprised to see him there. Peyton noticed that Sean's ears turned red. Hi, Marley, Sean said without making eye contact. Nobody said hi to Peyton, nor she did she expect him to. As she and Marley walked away, she heard the guys teasing Sean and laughing. Oh, hi, Sean, one of them said in an exaggerated... And in, oh my god, I can't say this word. In an exaggeratedly high feminine voice. Marley smiled. Well, that got his attention. I think you already had it, Peyton said. Well, now he knows that I know, which is important. Peyton's grades in school were higher than Marley's, yet often in conversations with Marley, she felt like she was slow to catch on. He knows that you know what? Marley let out an annoyed sounding sigh. He knows that I know that he likes me, you dork. How could somebody be so smart and so stupid at the same time? Peyton smiled and shrugged. I don't know, but with your looks and social skills and my book smarts, if you mixed us together, we'd meet the perfect person. To Peyton's relief, Marley smiled back. We would, wouldn't we? We could take over the world. Hey, I don't feel like going home yet. Why don't we walk down to the park? Peyton looked up at the graying sky. I don't know. I told my mum I'd be home by dark. Marley smiled her charming smile and cocked her head like an adorable puppy. Come on, we'll just stay ten minutes. It won't be full dark for another half an hour. She nudged Peyton's shoulder. We can go to the pond and feed the ducks. Peyton sighed. She had loved ducks ever since she was a little girl. The way they were so graceful in the water and so hilariously clumsy out of it. She loved their blank, serene little faces and their nasal sounding quacks. Okay, just for ten minutes. It's a deal, Marley said. Come on, we'll have more time there if we run. Marley, ra uh, Marley ran gracefully, and Peyton jogged along behind her on short little legs, like a greyhound being pursued by a corgi, Peyton thought. Part uh, oh my gosh, I'm mixing the names now. <laughs> Peyton and Marley put quarters into the duck food dispensers. At the sound of the pellets pouring from the chute, the ducks swam toward them, then waddled on to land, shaking their wet tail feathers. Here you go, guys, Peyton said, scattering the food on the ground. They bobbed their heads, quacking, and gobbled it up. Marley said, you want it? Go get it! And tossed the food so the ducks had to waggle, or uh, waggle, waddle, waddle. <laughs> waddle. So the ducks, the... Ah. Let me start again. Marley said, you want it? Go get it! And tossed the food so the ducks had to waddle a long way to find it. Some of them weren't bright enough to track where the food had landed, and Marley laughed. You're making them work awfully hard for these pellets, Peyton said, watching the confused ducks wander around. 
Hey, they should get some exercise, Marley said, grinning. People feed them all day long. They're little fatties. They don't look that fat to me, Peyton muttered to herself. But she let Marley have her fun. When the confused ducks finally wandered back her way, though, she made sure to place some food right in front of them. The streetlights came on. Oh no, Peyton said. We've stayed here longer than ten minutes, haven't we? I've got to go. My mum's going to kill me. Marley shook her head. You're such a little rule follower. I guarantee your mum isn't going to kill you. She'd probably just going to yell at you a little, and if she yells at you, so what? Peyton knew Marley wouldn't understand, but the real question, but the real answer to so what was that Peyton didn't like to disappoint her mum. She got along with her parents much better than most kids her age, and she wanted it to stay that way. Let's run, Peyton said. They ran until they reached the corner of Brook and Branch, where they stopped to part ways. Thanks for helping me out with Sean tonight, Marley said, giving Peyton a little half hug. Tomorrow at lunch, it's his turn to say hi to me, if he knows what he's doing. Which boys usually don't. Marley crinkled her nose, thinking of it, then gave a little wave goodbye and disappeared down her street. It was definitely full dark. As she walked home, Peyton tried to construct her side of the argument she knew she'd have with her mum as soon as she got home. Hi, Peyton, a voice called. Peyton looked over at the house two doors down from hers, where Abigail Sullivan was sitting on the front porch. What kind of person sits on her front porch by herself in the dark? Peyton wondered. But then she, won uh, then she remembered how weird Abigail was, which answered her question. Hi, Abigail, Peyton said, not stopping since she was already late. Now Peyton and Abigail had so little in common that it was strange to think that they were once best friends, because Abigail's house was so close to hers, the two of them had played together as preschoolers, playing dolls and store and school, wetting the sand in the sandbox to make castles and pies. They were inseparable when they started school and stayed that way until 7th grade, when Peyton started being interested in more grown-up things, and Abigail still wanted to play games and talk about wizards and unicorns. Peyton had flung herself in the direction of the popular girls who eventually accepted her. She had left Abigail to fend for herself, sometimes from her spot at the popular girls' table in the school cafeteria. Peyton would see Abigail sitting alone reading a book. I know I'm late, Peyton said as she walked in the front door. She figured she would cut her mum's accusation short by confessing up front. You are, her mum said. I was about to ask your dad to drive around and look for you, 